our next speaker, well, first I met this speaker through Twitter, by the way. Um, she often posted a bunch of stuff about Stan and I was like, oh, cool, I know Stan, I answer questions. And I looked at her research, previous talks, and it looks like she has some really cool stuff to say. So I asked, do you wanna speak at the conference? And that's how this works, folks. If I catch you on Twitter, if you say hi to me sometimes, like, hey, do you wanna give a talk? That's literally what happens. So come say hi to me at some point. I know we're not in person. If you ever see me in person, say hi, not tweet me, All right? But she's also an EMS, an EMT volunteer and has responded to over 600 911 calls. Please welcome Alexa. Hi everyone and thanks Jared for the great introduction. I'm gonna assume you can all see the slides and everything's working smoothly unless someone interrupts me in a panic otherwise. Today we're talking about R for the planet. I thought when I gave this talk we'd all be in the same room but we're still all on the same planet you can see it underneath your feet if you look down wherever you are. I am an ecologist and an environmental data scientist. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my work and also about how you as data scientists might be able to interface with it a little bit. As someone who works on the environment, I thought I'd get some frequently asked questions out of the way because this is often where my conversations start. Humans and our activities are reshaping the planet. We know that that's true and it's happening in lots of ways, but the most high profile and controversial is often how we are uh, reshaping the climate through our emissions of greenhouse gases. We know that that's happening and we know that most of the effects have not been great. And we also know that it's us. But crucially, we also know that it's not too late. A lot of climate scientists are fond of saying that no matter how fast you're going, on a highway, you can always put your foot on the brake. And I'll add as an ecologist that our impacts on the planet go beyond just changing the climate. We're also changing water, soils, we're cutting down forests, we're changing the chemistry of the oceans. And these are all issues that I've worked on and I'm happy to talk to you about if they matter to you. So this talk has a lot of links in it and you'll the URL is, is up here. You can go find the talk on GitHub and follow the links. I know this is just a presentation where you can't do that. But I've included a lot related to climate and climate change. If there's anything that you have always wanted to know and never gotten answered. And because I know we're all on Twitter, I've also linked to a number of great climate scientists and environmental journalists who might be interesting for you to engage with. Like I said, I'm an ecologist and an environmental data scientist. I use large scale data sets on biodiversity uh, large scale, meaning over large spatial extents, and also often going far back into the past to understand patterns and processes in nature. As a scientist, this is just a really cool thing to study, but I'm also doing this with the hope of informing and improving the way that we manage natural resources and conserve biodiversity. And I do all of this work in R, despite the fact that I study nature, mostly the oceans, which we'll get to, I never actually leave my office and I just code all day like many of you. So I thought I'd introduce you to the environmental data science community and explain to you why we all use R, which by and large we do. First of all, as you I'm sure know, R is really good at statistics. Many people who are academic scientists using R came from languages like MATLAB or programs like ArcGIS and are used to having really good access to statistical tools that are really easy to use in R. I use a lot of Bayesian statistics, which we'll talk about more in a second. R also facilitates transparency and reproducibility, and I, I can't overstate how big of a deal this is for my field. First of all, it's an open source language, unlike things like MATLAB that some of my colleagues use. So simply by definition, it's much more transparent and reproducible because everyone can access and ideally rerun your code. You probably remember learning the scientific method. You're supposed to make observations, form a hypothesis, run an experiment or collect data. And as actual scientists, when we've done all those things, we then write up our results and share them. And when we do that, it is supposed to be fully reproducible, which is to say someone could take what we wrote, go home, recreate the exact same thing and hopefully get the same result. As science has become much more computational and just much more complex, this has gotten really hard to do. And I would argue that it's basically impossible to do without open source code. And R is kind of what we hang our hat on in terms of achieving reproducibility in our science. The R ecosystem, which includes our studio, GitHub, and our Markdown, 
enables us to do better science in less time. There's actually a whole paper about this and you're welcome to email me if you'd like to read it. But it, it, it makes the argument both that our science is better using these tools because it's transparent and reproducible. And also it's faster because of all of the reasons that R can facilitate things like data cleaning and running complex models that make us better at our jobs. I have been working recently on a particular way in which we are changing the planet, which is reshuffling species around the globe. I call this species on the move. A lot of plants, animals, everything in nature are moving. On average, they're going upwards in elevation, deeper into the oceans and generally towards the poles. And almost certainly it's because they're chasing cooler climates as where they used to live has gotten warmer. So this is a video of the historical distribution of one particular fish near where many of you live. This is the black sea bass. You can see early on it's concentrated kind of in the mid-Atlantic around North Carolina. This is a, these are hot spots of its density. And as the years go on, it moves further north. And you can see not only does it appear in these northern regions where it didn't used to live, but it also has kind of vanished from where it historically was most abundant. So this is a, a classic example of a species on the move. And you can imagine that this causes a lot of challenges for those of us who are trying to either preserve biodiversity or help people have access to it. This is a species that you might have eaten. It's a popular fisheries target. And this species on the move brings up a lot of challenges and questions like, should we allow fishermen from New Jersey to fish black sea bass, even though they never used to because it was never up there? Or should we give all of the fishing rights to the fishermen from North Carolina who always fished it, but would have to literally drive their boats up to these hotspots that you see on the map now to still catch it, which is wasteful and inefficient. And this, I'm gonna talk about this in the oceans, but this challenge is playing out on land and with all kinds of species and it's making it really hard to conserve and manage them. But what we'd really like to know isn't just where they were in the past and what the temperature was in the past, which is kind of what I just showed you. It'd be even better to know where they're going to be next year, because then we could really say, okay, we can anticipate these changes in the environment. And that gives us much better tools to be able to manage them uh, with good outcomes for nature and for people. Ecological forecasting in general is a really hot topic. And this is something that I've gotten increasingly interested in. But it's also really difficult. Explaining the past is much easier than predicting the future. You can come up with covariates for historical dynamics and say, okay, temperature is really correlated with where things were found in the past. But that's not the same as saying, I know exactly what will happen next year. Those of you in New York are familiar with this challenge. I can tell you, and you'll probably believe me, that climate change has made hurricanes more frequent and more intense in the Atlantic over the past few decades. And we might all agree that that's true. But I can't tell you exactly when the next hurricane will strike and how strong it will be. You probably would love to know that. Maybe you're considering buying an apartment and you really want to know if it's going to get trashed by the next hurricane. We'll probably never be able to forecast hurricanes a year out, but it would be helpful to forecast ecological dynamics with more precision so that we can make more targeted management decisions. But ecosystems are really, really complicated. Imagine taking a spoonful of dirt from a tree or a park or a backyard near you and looking at it under a microscope. You would see bacteria, maybe fungi, uh, some seeds of plants or some roots, and those would all be interacting. They'd be consuming nutrients. Some would grow, some would die. I don't think I could even write down a model to describe those dynamics terribly well, let alone all of the soil under a tree plus a tree. And then imagine an entire forest with people interacting with it and animals these ecosystems are extremely hard to model. But that's what I've been trying to do. Uh, so the project I'm gonna to talk to you about a little bit today, and it's all implemented in R, so I thought it would be a good way to introduce you to what uh, people like me have been doing. Uh, what I'm trying to do is simulate near-term shifts in species distributions that are responding to temperature. And I'm trying this with a few fish in the Atlantic because we have a lot of data for them. But a lot of data is relative in the environmental space. In we, Those of us who work in marine systems often joke that counting fish is like counting trees, except they're invisible and they move. The only data that I have are annual surveys conducted by the federal government where they go out and go fishing, and then they write down what was in the net. What was there, how big it was, how many. That's it. 
So for a particular species, I'm trying to infer all of the processes that I'm about to tell you about from just data that's like, okay, in these 90 samples, there were zero of the fish you're interested in, and then over here there were two, but they were small, and then down here we found eight, and they were pretty big, and so on. That's all we've got. What I'm trying to do, though, is to fit mechanistic models to those data that I just described to estimate process rates that we can use to simulate the future. So essentially, I'm trying to estimate key rates of how the species biology responds to temperature that we can run forward with temperature projections for the future and ideally forecast species on the move. Uh, this is a little bit of the nuts and bolts of this model. And you're welcome to just take a deep breath, stand up, maybe relax for a minute if this is not your jam. It's a hierarchical Bayesian model that I'm fitting using Stan and some great R packages that have made that possible. The model has some key features that allow me to ask these questions. It's a spatial model, of course, because we want species to be able to shift. But we approximate the coastline as just a line with conti contiguous patches along it. Each one is a degree high in latitude. The model is also age structured, and that's because the age of fish, which we can kind of guess from their size, tells us something about conditions when they were born. So if we go fishing, we just find a ton of fish that are four years old. We might guess that four years ago, conditions were really good for that fish to migrate in or to reproduce. We're estimating most of the rates that we need. A few of them come from the literature, and one of them is temperature dependent, only one because otherwise the model has a very hard time fitting. Like I said, the only data that we have are historical abundance and distribution. So where the fish were, how many of them were during our training years, which is I think 34. And then we make an annual forecast every year for the next 10 years from 2006 to 2015 that we can then actually test against the real data. We're also testing it against uh, more conventional ways of understanding species distributions, which are kind of correlative in nature. So if you think back to that map I showed you of black sea bass with the uh, blob moving up the coast, many uh, tools look at those historical distributions, look at the temperature where those species were found, and then just project those temperatures forward in space and say that's where it's going to be next year. So we're competing this more mechanistic approach against those correlative approaches. This is the structure of the Bayesian model in a network diagram, which I'll talk you through briefly. And it's in this kind of um, schematic form so that it's easier to understand. What makes the model hierarchical are these different levels. And the top level is our model for the actual observation process. I would love to say that we are observing these populations without error, but we definitely aren't. Some years, the boat didn't run as much because the government defunded the program. Sometimes there wasn't someone on the boat who's very good at identifying the fish. There are a lot of sources of observation error. So in this model, we say that the data that we actually observe, which are the number of fish in every patch in this model, every age group and every year, is conditional on the true number, which we never observe and never really know, but we're trying to estimate, plus some parameters, all these things down here, parameters, related to the observation process, an error term, a term related to the fact that small fish don't get caught as much, and finally, a term related to the fact that most of the records that we have are actually zeros, like they didn't find the fish at all. So it's a two-stage model that first says, was, the, was there a positive encounter at all? And then if yes, we model the population. And we model the population with this process model that says the true number of individuals we think, this is sort of a set of equations describing how we're proposing the world works. The true number of fish in the sea is due to the number of fish that die. That's actually a term that we get from the literature. The number of fish that migrate in between the patches, which we call dispersal, and the number of new fish that appear every year from reproduc reproduction, which we call recruitment here. That's the term in this particular schematic that we made uh, dependent on temperature, although we can move the temperature dependency around and we have. So that actually has several parameters. First of all, recruitment is just super stochastic in marine populations. We know that. So it has an autocorrelation parameter to tune the stochasticity. There's also an optimal temperature at which recruitment is maximized. And then finally, a sensitivity parameter that tells us if it gets too hot or too cold, how quickly does recruitment drop off? So this is our cartoon of how we're saying these populations work. And we're trying to fit this model to the data 
estimate all of these gray boxes, and then run it forward with projected temperatures to simulate the future. I would love on this slide to show you our results, but the truth is this model is not strictly working perfectly. Because as people who've done this kind of modeling probably know, it's really hard to estimate all the parameters I just showed you from only the data that we have in hand. So that's been one challenge, the, just the parameter estimation. Another challenge has actually been the data modeling process. So I told you that we, in this model structure, say that the observed data are conditional on the true population size or, and state. But the data that we have are really strange. Some, uh, the most common thing is that we have zeros. We don't encounter any fish. But for some of these species, you encounter one fish and then less frequently two and less frequently three, but then also occasionally you encounter like 7,000 or 8,000 because they're schooling fish. There's no data distribution in statistics that from which you can draw a lot of zeros, some ones, some twos, some 7,000, some 8,000 at a frequency that would remotely reconstruct that data. So if anyone has experience making those types of custom distributions, do let me know. Because uh, one of the recurring challenges in environmental data science, and partly why I wanted to talk about this project, is our own data limitations and finding the right statistical approaches to get the most inference from the data that we have in hand. But I want to end by coming back to where we started, which is R and the planet and you. All of the data just described are public. You can go download them. They're from federally conducted surveys that are freely available on the internet. And it's not just that. This is a link to our open size database of packages, which includes dozens that access tons and tons of environmental data sets that could match any of your personal questions and interests. You might be interested in plastic pollution, in butterflies or bees. Maybe you're interested in soil health or air pollution in communities of, um, that have been redlined. All of those data sets are available. You can go use them and go start to explore the issues that matter to you. But I would encourage you, if you do go down that path, which I think is super exciting, of course, it's what I'm doing, to be a little bit cautious about using these data. They often have contingencies like any data set that aren't that obvious from the start. You might notice in my project that I cut it off at 2015. That's because in 2016, because of a uh, government shutdown, the survey just didn't run. So you might look at the data and think, oh my God, there were no fish, they all went extinct that year, when in fact, it's because of an issue with the data collection that's really non-obvious. So that's one example of why partnering with people who have domain knowledge is really important. But the good news is that everyone in my field spends way too much time on Twitter, and we're generally very friendly. So if any of you have an interest in exploring environmental topics, I'm sure that you can connect with an environmental scientist who would be delighted to partner with a data scientist like you who's really excited about exploring the questions that matter to you personally. Thank you so much for your attention and hopefully we'll chat more later.